we have the next speaker with us, Mr. Jeff Leo Harman, going to present about the five years of video marketing. So, Mr. Jeff Leo Harman is a B2B showrunner and the founder and president of Madison Making and Market. As the champion of sales and marketing alignment, Jeff's passion lies in leveraging the power of content, technology, and data to help companies and individuals realize extraordinary growth. Jeff was recently named one of the top 50 influencers in content marketing. In addition to being a mobile marketing pioneer, he has an instant belief that organizations are better off engaging their audience with educational and entertaining content rather than blasting them with traditional interruption based advertising campaigns. This perspective is well informed after a 15 year career of the Nielsen company working with Global Fortune. 15 brands in measuring content and advertising investments and effectiveness. To know, know more about the tricks on getting popular, let's call upon Mr. Jeff Leo Herman to tell us more interesting facts about five years of video marketing. The definition of video marketing is not complex. In fact, it's rather simple using video to promote or market your brand, product or service. A strong marketing campaign incorporates video into the mix. It can increase your screen, your search engine ranking, click through rates, open rates and conversion. Get to know the 5 years of video marketing, we have Mr. Jeff Leo Herman with us. Dear Mr. Jeff, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you and welcome. I am. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. So. Today we're going to speak to Align to Accelerate, or otherwise, how to drive engagement through building your own media platform. And it's very important to drive engagement and conversion by starting to own your audience versus renting your audience. And we're going to go through 10 tips today to speak to how you can better own your audience instead of renting your audience and having third parties control access to your customers. So uh, thank you for the great introduction. We don't have to spend time on, on introduction, but I am pleased to be here. And I do hail from the uh, United States and a proud member of the Chicago Booth Business School, as well as a Nielsen alumni. And I currently have my own firm, Madison, Michigan and Market, in which we make creative financial and analytical strategic decisions for our clients uh, when they are building their own media platform. So I ask you all to stay alert, right? And we all have to stay alert in this present time, in this day and age, uh, because the market is changing so quickly, the dynamics that we're facing as marketers and sales professionals every day and business owners, uh, it really causes us to stay alert. And the question I have for all of us, uh, when's the last time you've heard someone say, surf the web? Like, I'm going to go surf the web. Is that a common question that you hear? And moderator, do you have, uh, have you heard this term lately, surf the web? Well, uh, I will just continue on. Uh, so surfing the web was something we maybe did in the 90s and the early part of the 2000s, but we no longer surf the web, right? Because we live in a world of content made by and for the mobile platform. And so the app economy and the small screen has really started to dominate uh, the way in which we consume information on the internet. So gone are the days of surfing the internet and just browsing from site to site. And today we go to much more targeted, specific, and explicit focuses on our, on our web behavior. And the reason for that is um, we're lingering. We're lingering on Facebook, right? And this is a chart on the left from 2011, but it's, it's continued on ever since. Facebook dominates time spent online. It's the on-ramp and off-ramp to the internet. Uh, millennials consume the percent of their news through Facebook. So Facebook is, dominates the way in, in other mobile applications and social media application, applications now dominate the way we spend our time online. And we have to figure out a way to get our connections and our members and our audience off of social media and onto our own platform. And you can even see further evidence around the domination of social media and Facebook specifically. The connections economy is growing at three times the rate as the search economy, right? So Google, a massive 
um, organization, 20% year-over-year growth, according to Mary Meeker's slide here, but you can see 62% year-over-year growth for Facebook. So the connections economy and that social media economy is growing three times faster than the search economy, and search was great at, you know, asking a question and getting us to our destination, to the website we wanted to visit, where Facebook, uh, we tend to be stuck in, you know, consumers spend time in the feed, and, and the question I have is, why is Facebook successful? Why are we spending so, so much time in the feed? Because it's compelling, engaging content, right? It's not only text, it's video, it's imagery, it's dynamic information algorithmically delivered to you and your personal specifications to really keep you engaged and, and living and scrolling through on this platform. And that's why their advertising has been so impactful because it's this com combination of video, contextual, and dynamic information served to you in a, in a format as such that really, um, you know, compel you to take action. And, but, you know, on the theme of staying alert, I, I believe we're being exploited. I mean, we know we're being exploited because of the domination of FANG, right? Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. One might want to add Apple to this to have a FANG uh, situation. But, you know, I know we have latest uh, movement around GDPR, but, you know, our data is being parsed and monetized, and we're saying thank you, right, because we are the product of social media. Social media would not exist without all of us participating in social media, but it's dangerous, and we're going to talk about how, you know, this is renting the attention of consumers. Anyone that drives a social media campaign, it's amazing. It's an amazing way to target consumers, but at the same point, you're being targeted, um, and, and you're leaving, marketers are leaving their connections on those social media platforms, and that reach can be suppressed at any point in time and, and force you to cause, you know, charge more money. So it all goes back to email is still the purest and most scalable way to have direct connections with your audience, right? Email, your email is, is still not al algorithmically controlled. So uh, those are ways in which we want to tip the scales back in our favor, right? As marketers, our job is to optimize our websites and give people what they want when they want it, right? And Google is rewarding companies because of the fickle nature of consumers. Google's rewarding companies that give resources and give consumers what they want when they want it. And marketers that provide all that great information online, engaging informational content, can tip the scales back in the favor of the sales profession. But, the, you know, a word of warning around the sales profession Marketers are the front lines of communications. Marketers are in the driver's seat with consumers these days. And from a B2B standpoint, the sales profession has to stop this tribal knowledge uh, mindset, right, and this campaign mindset. So often we see we have an event, invitations are issued, we have meet people, and trade shows, events, what have you, that information is left in the inbox of the sales professional, and they have to stop, right? They have to better understand that emails collected and run through proper marketing automation uh, programs give you sustainable institutional value and institutional knowledge and access to, to contacts over time and, and no longer having that information die in the inbox of the sales team. Uh, but that speaks to the need for alignment, right? And so item number two on how to engage your audience, uh, you have to properly align internally. So marketers and digital marketers specifically need better alignment with their sales organization, their broader organization, and you have to really start with strategy, right? It all starts with strategy. And any marketing program you have, any digital marketing program you have, uh, top to bottom, it has to be perfectly consistent. First, what's the business strategy, goals and KPIs, trickling down to a marketing strategy to support the goals and the business strategy. And then the series of programs underneath, and then finally the channels or the activation plan. And so with that top to bottom alignment on strategy, you end up aligning your business objectives to your buyer's journey. And so to the extent that your business objectives here across the top, you will, you know, businesses want to acquire new leads, develop relationships, contract, sell to their, you know, clients and then retain and grow buyers you know are typically in status quo mode until they recognize they have a problem 
which they have to research and consider, then they commit to a solution, and then they become advocates for the solution. And the status of the company, um, oftentimes when the buyers are in this kind of early stage of consideration, they're not known to the company, um, and they're unknown. And they move into known once they raise their hand and you know kind of consider the fact that, that they're looking for solutions. And so marketing has to own that full continuum, that full perspective of the buyer's journey and sales execution happens uh, once it's a known contact and a known entity. And, there, and there's so much progress that can be made in the upper funnel with engaging content to build an audience, which then turns into leads and, and potential revenue. And leading us to item number three, alienation. And moderator, I will pause for a minute just to uh, make sure that we're on track and, and that we're not having any, any difficulties here understanding. Okay, we're good. So we will continue. Uh, as far as alienation is concerned, one thing we don't want to do is alienate our customers. So if we get strategic alignment, and we have goals consistent with our program, consistent with our channels, it's always, of, of course, of being very mindful of who our target audience is. And as they say, as we all say, if you're targeting everyone, you're targeting no one. So a high degree of precision around the persona that you're targeting is very critical, which will drive engagement because th these days, given the level, the competition for attention and the, the way in which people are stuck on social, unless it's perfectly aligned to a very specific persona profile comprised of responsibilities and their desires, their motivations and fears, uh, their demographic and firmographic information, and even their targets and touch points, we're, we're going to be, be very ineffective and lack productivity in our marketing campaigns. Uh, which leads us to transparency and why transparency is so important. Uh, because we have to really take a deep, close look at the sources and drivers of revenue. What worked yesterday may not work today. So you can see here that oftentimes we, we know that what's tend to be very effective, of course, is referrals, direct referrals, right? Direct relationships that are referred from other direct relationships. But there's a broad continuum looking at closed one versus closed lost opportunities from Salesforce from what are the sources of drivers of revenue and what, how can you do more of what's working? And this goes back to alignment, right? Having a single version of the truth, having an always-on strategy between sales and marketing, and knowing the handoffs of what a marketing qualified lead is to a sales qualified lead across that marketing spectrum, and using engaging content to generate trust with marketing qualified leads, get them out of status quo mode into problem recognition mode, so then you can you know, turn them into a sales qualified lead and, and ultimately sales execution. And these, this is all setting us up to um, even how you define these stages. So a question might, might be wonder, what stages of progression are there to get someone from marketing qualified to sales qualified? Uh, these are fairly common, fairly obvious, but we know we want a qualified lead to make the sales team more productive, and there's probabilities associated with those leads. But you know the progression that builds trust between sales and marketing teams qualified to pitching, to proposal, to negotiations, and, and won or lost. Which, now that we have what I would call our internal team, sales and marketing team well aligned, we can truly get into the method of engaging customers. So tip number five, in this world we live in, we're getting people off of social media and onto your own platform where you have direct access to them. We have to think like a publisher and build a loyal audience. So every company, be it a B2B technology company or a manufacturing company or a healthcare company or a B2C organization, uh, consumer products, it's all about building a direct connection with the audience by thinking like a publisher. And, and there's a model here to think like a publisher and once again this is consistent recognizing the fact that social media is the on-ramp to the internet and that's what drives a lot of engagement and you can get tremendous insights from social media thanks to the analytics platform but always have a call to action off of social and back to your own website your own dot com to build that subscriber perspective so content drives engagement which drives insights but those insights are best yielded by having a strong call to action 
off of that platform to know what's working to drive subscribers to your own platform. And and this is a is a an emerging, you know, this is classically known as content marketing, right? And we are familiar with companies like HubSpot, Salesforce, Adobe. <clears throat> they all do an amazing job at content marketing, building trust with their audience through content to sell more software. But companies like Arrow Electronics uh, acquired a large media publisher. Johnson & Johnson has the Baby Center website. Uh, it's a website that builds trust with new moms, and it's, and it's not even well known that Baby Center is owned and, and driven by uh, the J&J family of companies. And so even there's uh, blogs, and specifically I have a blog called Sales Quants in which it's how to learn, grow, and achieve greatness using Salesforce.com. These are all examples of owned media strategies in which we produce content, put it out there to build trust, and those trust then builds leads to business relationships. And a quote from one of my favorite people, Joe Polizzi, who published a book with Robert Rose, um, it's challenging for a marketing professional to leverage content with a mission that revolves around the product and not the customer. And so this product marketing or product-centric marketing, promotional marketing, egocentric marketing, uh, it's fine if you're at the bottom of the funnel to want to, for consumers to want to consume product level information, but if you're at the upper funnel, you can't really promote to someone at, at the upper funnel without having a lot of reps and frequency required to get them into the lower funnel. Uh, we're really building trust through content and, and focusing on the customer need or the audience need first, building the trust to then, to then get them um, into that relationship uh, and here Robert Rose also quotes, it's the use of content that will not only build audiences to drive creation and retention of customers, but also do it at a profit. And so this book, Killing Marketing, is an amazing book that talks about marketing as a profit center and the variety of business models a marketer can embrace once they build an audience. And so not only does building an audience build trust and helps you sell more product, but then that audience that you coalesce can help you monetize uh, in other ways like events, like uh, affiliate marketing, and, and, and several other ways in which you can drive profitable action once you have that audience assembled beyond the scope of your products and services. So I want to uh, speak to a case study here uh, really quickly and just make sure that we are, we got a, okay, thank you. We are, I'm just checking the comments here. Does this look familiar to anyone? This is a treadmill and it looks like it's being used as a clothes hamper. So companies that say manufacture large products like this Life Fitness treadmill, uh, once that device, that product gets into the home, uh, the treadmill lacks the degree of engagement. So is that treadmill, what can that treadmill do to get used? Does Life Fitness, would Life Fitness, the maker of this treadmill, be satisfied with this picture? Is this an appropriate use of this device? I doubt it, right? It's, it's, it's uh, common, but it's probably not an appropriate use of this device. And wouldn't it be great if um, this device could speak to us, but Life Fitness has no way to compel their buyer, the, the owner of this, to actually use this product. Uh, but what about, say, a, a manufacturer that doesn't just sell equipment, but they're really focused on changing lives? And so Peloton is also an equipment manufacturer, but their focus is not on just selling the equipment and hoping you buy another in a few years. Their focus is on continued engagement. So Peloton isn't necessarily an exercise equipment manufacturer. They are a media company, and they are thinking like a publisher and thinking like a media company because their device, their piece of exercise equipment, comes mounted with a screen, a tablet, in which you can engage in real-time activity, um, both working out and all the metrics, and it speaks to you effectively, right? The bike speaks to you from a wide variety of either social media, email, or this direct access through the platform. Uh, Peloton is actually a media company first uh, and, a, and an exercise equipment manufacturer second because they offer world-class instructors, right? So back on this notion of personas, they have a persona to fit almost every type of person that exercises. You have the clubby guy here. You have the hip girls, the ex-marine here. So there's a wide variety 
of instructors. And, and, you know, Peloton programs more video content than the TV networks do today, right? So Peloton programs, uh, you know, hours and hours of, of media content on a daily basis. I believe they publish, um, you know, approximately upwards of 20 hours of live content on a daily basis, which is very significant relative to the traditional media platforms. And they have a community, of course, on Facebook to drive fans and engagement. They have an e-commerce strategy, right? So this is an exercise equipment company that's producing media, more than a network, that's engaging with the community using social, that also has an e-commerce strategy to sell more cool tank tops that their instructors are wearing. And they continue to reward you and track you for your performance. And so this is a view of my dashboard here. Uh, when I hit 100 rides, they said, congrats, you're welcome to the Century Club. Here's a t-shirt, right? So um, an amazing way, this two-way two connection they have with their audience, right? So people that buy their equipment, that continue to use it, their continued engagement and continued dialogue. So gone are the days of just buying something and it's gone, it's, it's consumed. The, the notion that the companies are acting like media companies, publishers, to continue to drive that engagement with consumers is the winning strategy. And so summarizing here, Peloton is in the business of selling equipment, selling a bike, but also accessories, media content, ongoing subscriptions, and further monetizing their audience through a wide variety of, of strategies. And so th this, they are maximizing their potential to engage their audience and make money through multiple revenue streams. And they've done that because they have the trust, right? So they've built the trust of their audience. And we have a picture here of Miley Cyrus, uh, or I'm sorry, Hannah Montana on the left and Miley Cyrus on the right. You know, she violated the trust of her audience at some point in time when she shifted into more adult-themed entertainment content. And that's shocking, right? So that continuity and consistency is so important when you want to, um, you know, have engaging connections with your consumers. And that also with that trust comes focus and really want to focus your efforts and not have a single misstep because focus once again drives results and you want to be the same the brand the strategy you have it has to be enduring and this campaign mentality of constantly switching things up uh, is better off if it's continuity with a strategy and focused effort delivered over time because with this focus, uh, if you commit to, say, a Facebook Live presentation, uh, Facebook Live video event one time a week, well, through that consistent focus, you can then atomize that content, right? Break it up into smaller pieces and use those smaller assets to feed your inbound and your paid media acquisition strategy. And really just, once again, this is uh, consistent with the funnel. How do we engage at the upper level and use vignettes of that content, atomize it to continue to feed leads down the funnel um, to nurture those, those you know, leads to win. So this focus of doing fewer things, but of the things you do to further atomize and take advantage of those fewer things to do uh, pays a lot of dividends. And how do you do this? Well, it's, it's similar to the rise of the showrunner. Right? And the showrunner is known in Hollywood circles, uh, the creators of Walking Dead, Breaking Bad, Vince Gilligan, of course, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Larry David. They run shows. They create shows. They create episodic content. And I'm arguing that all companies to engage customers and clients these days must create episodic content on a consistent basis and run a show um, relative to your audience to build that trust and and drive you know drive those results forward, and it's as simple as uh, how do you have a five P model: plan, produce, publish, promote, and per measure performance. Once again, how can you go live on Facebook and say and ask me anything, and then use those derivative assets on a consistent basis to set up a rhythm for reporting? And so having that rhythm, that consistency, that singular focus. Using one live video asset here on the left, which you download and then upload to the YouTube channel to multi-purpose your platform. Send that into a blog post, possibly extract the audio for an MP3 file and upload that as a podcast. 
but then continue to share it on LinkedIn, Twitter with calls to action back to the website and then send a newsletter. So this notion of lather, rinse, and repeat and establishing a rhythm for your strategy and your episodic content is very critical. And, and this even you know, leads to this consistency and this setting of behavioral expectation leads to even from an internal perspective how you can best forecast, right? And how you can really, on a timely basis, nail your production and your publishing schedule to build that um, expectation and that behavior with your audience uh, so they know exactly when it's coming and they'll miss it if you're gone. Uh, which leads into prediction. So now that we've engaged our audience, how do we predict success? So in a, from a B2B perspective, marketers selling products and services to other businesses, it's important that if we invest in building a media company, um, how do you tell the CFO, I'm building a media company and I'm a manufacturer, well, how can you predict success? Well, this goes back to with the proper alignment, how to nail your forecast with certainty. Um, it really just comes down to looking at tying all of your marketing strategy and programs at the upper funnel to executed strategies and channels to nail your forecast with certainty. And that comes through sales best practices. And sales is all about being accountable and being held highly accountable. Because we want to, if we are going to be investing in media and building assets, and assets pay returns over time, how can you be held accountable and not only have your sales force share, you know, share in the results? So through building trust and driving engagement and tracking everything in a CRM and having a proper forecast, uh, you're driving sales. Well, having a media strategy is bigger than just driving sales. As I mentioned, there are multiple revenue streams. So how can you basically reward that performance and you know have insights around not only pipeline created, your deals booked today here on the x-axis, what deals were booked, but pipeline created for the future. And you can see here, this is just a quick look. Another way to look at the data is, you know, uh, short-term versus long-term perspective. So not only am I booking deals, and Katie did a great job of booking deals, but she didn't create much pipeline this, this time horizon, where Joey created a lot of pipeline and booked a lot of deals, so he's in, a, he's in a great place. That's supporting the sales organization. What about the marketing organization? Marketers can put a valuation on their audience, right? So you can literally say, my audience that and the assets I'm investing in pay returns over time. And not only does this audience lead to sales opportunities, you know, this quarter, next quarter, next year, but there's also an, 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 an intrinsic value to your records, to your email database. Having a depth of behavioral information, a depth of personal information, a depth of engagement information, you can model out the true enterprise value of your audience database, right? And it's beyond the scope of your sales pipeline. It's really talking about the value of your database. And that's a savior for CMOs because it really allows them to show their true, the true value they're adding to the enterprise beyond the scope of the sales pipeline. So to wrap it up, our key takeaways here, uh, I believe that every company is a media company. And if we focus more on adding value and pit, not pitching products, we'll build much more trust because we want to build these loyal audiences around shared values, but then get into a process and a rhythm and reporting about that, about that. So we can scale our activity. It's all about scale and driving um, these diversified revenue streams. So with that, I will uh, stop here and just say thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to, um, to share this information with all of you today and look forward to your feedback. Thank you, Mr. Jeff, for giving us the valuable information on Fires, five years of video marketing. Dear audience and uh, presenters, please raise questions to Mr. Jeff so that he can answer the questions immediately. And we have uh, two questions, Jeff. What is the importance of video marketing for business? Raised by question raised by Ms. Monica. Uh, the best way for video marketing. So video is the most engaging platform 
And and basically, if you have one of these, you can get started with video marketing. So this is my iPhone, and there is a there is a video marketing strategy that focuses on building trust and how you can make a plan, produce content, publish that content, promote the content, and then measure performance. So that is uh, the best way for video marketing. And I would argue that a selfie strategy using the phone is the best way to get started with video marketing. Because you want to build trust with your audience, you want to get into their mindset, and you want to start adding value. So once again, don't promote products, but but build trust through helpful problem-solving content. Okay, and another one question is, what is the importance of video marketing for business? I, so I'll, I'll say that you know, video is a very powerful medium, and it's a way in which it translates across multiple platforms but you know sight sound motion emotion uh, it, close to 80 percent of marketers will be investing in video in 2018 and into 2019 and so video is is a portable strategy in the fact that say you have this is a long we're in a long form session right here right so we've been talking about 20 minutes there are so many smaller vignettes to be extracted out of this longer video stream. So video allows you to invest in one main asset and then repurpose that asset many times as we shared in the presentation. And so um, I would actually have to say that investing in a video strategy, a singular focused major asset strategy allows you to yield many derivative assets to, to fully populate your engagement. Okay, we have another question from Jabu. Uh, what are the best CMO and CRM tools for audience growth development and audience valuation? Please text as I am deaf. May not understand you while trying to lip read. So, Mr. Jeff, please. So, Salesforce.com is my CRM of choice, but the audience valuation model is a model I built in Excel. And so Excel is is the modeling, and it's it's got 11 dimensions on nearness to ideal client profile. So how ideal is the client? Level of behavioral information: uh, are they active or are they dormant? And then the depth of information, be it demographic or firmographic. So how much, uh, how well do, how deep of a profile do you have on that person? Through that combination of those. Well, those 11 um, attributes, we can then put a value based upon cost per acquisition, which then calculates the full value of, of the um, audience. Okay. And another question is from uh, Rich Sweeney. What are the benefits of marketing with video? I mean, the benefits are trust to build a trusted relationship because it basically you know what it's like to work with someone. So text, you have to interpret a lot. And we all know emails some, can some come across misconstrued sometimes, but the same information delivered in a video, you can detect sarcasm, you can detect a joke, you can detect a hint or um, something that you know, you're trying to convey in a verbal way versus in a text-based way. So Video is about building trust, and video is scalable. So if you do video on LinkedIn, that video travels in the feed, and I have people that I have not seen in a year, but because I publish on LinkedIn on such a consistent basis using video, they feel like there's a very close personal relationship. Okay, and we have another question. I have an idea to start a floating second street view video creation platform, so it will show near me places in the video format. So how successful it could be? I guess it depends on the level, the context of the data you're offering, right? And, and so if that's a popular, highly trafficked street corner, um, you know, that could be an amazing platform uh, with data to properly, precisely define exactly who's traveling through. And that feedback loop set up made better on street or off function. Okay, uh, thanks for your time, uh, Mr. Jeff, and nice to meet you in GDMS too, and hope everyone has got the answers.
uh, properly. And uh, thanks for your time, Mr. Chip, for presenting the five years of video marketing in GDMS2. Thank you.